This is the Mercedes-Benz GLE, and that is the Mercedes-Benz GLC. I'm gonna be comparing both of these SUVs, and it's actually a lot more interesting than you might think, because of course, the GLE's on an older platform, released originally in 2018. This is the facelift, so you get new design for the headlamps. I really like this three-spoke design for the star pattern in the grille. What about this alpine gray color? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Now the GLC is actually on a newer platform from 2022. So this gets better ADAS as well as a better MBUX as compared to the GLE. The front is a lot more shallow. It's a lot shorter than the tall upright GLE. Although the grille is again, similar in these two cases and I really like the wing and the pattern up here. Digital lights, really cool, really useful at night. Has some really nice animations as well, which help you when you're driving at night. I also really like these 20 inch AMG line wheels with the machined finish. I like wheels which have a lot of spokes. It makes it seem more luxurious. This also has a night pack, so you get blacked out window frames, a nice running board. And again, from this angle, it does look more like a crossover estate rather than a traditional SUV. Another important difference is the size. This is 4.7 meters and the GLE is 4.9 meters. 21 inch AMG wheels on this particular car and body colored bumpers. So yes, it's a bit more sporty, but just look at the proportions, the flat doors, the tall and straight roof line, and of course, critically, this fantastic C-pillar. This is definitely an SUV. And I love the C-pillar because it also harks back to old traditional Mercedes SUVs. And therefore, in my eyes, this is the prettier of the two. But what about you? Put your preference down in the comments below. In this profile, the height difference becomes more evident. The GLE has a more butch and straight upright design. I like the tail lamps as well. It's very sleek, looks really nice and modern. If we go to the GLC, this is a little bit shorter and is a little bit more curvy, I would say. It's not so upright. There's more angles. There's more 3D kind of sculpting. Here is the key fob for the GLE. Keep it in my pocket. There's some nice heft to the door and you're invited with this plush design on the interior. The seat controls here, seat heating. And in this case, you can also use that to adjust the seat of your passenger, the front passenger. The sound system is also phenomenal. 3D audio. Animal leather seems to be the predominant uh, variant here. But I do like this light color. Not the easiest to maintain. It gets dirty fairly quickly. Getting inside is pretty easy. There is a bit of a climb up, which I actually love. I love that it feels like an SUV. And the seating position as well. I have the seat a little bit higher so that I can see the top of the hood. And I do feel like I'm in a big GLE. The expansive front dashboard is very flat and straight. These two uh, screens along with the air conditioning vent and this design element just really emphasizes the width. The GLE, just because it's a bit bigger than the GLC, adds to the luxury feeling in my opinion, because space is luxury. And then in the driver's seat, you also have a much wider view out the front. So it does feel like you're in a much more upmarket vehicle. I like the steering wheel. You also have paddle shifters here. Capacitive buttons. This setup I don't think is the best setup and we'll talk about what the GLC has and see if it's any better. But you can press some of these buttons. For example, I can use this to change the view up front and I really love Mercedes head-up displays. They're really large and really bright. Right next to this instrument cluster here is the actual infotainment screen and here's where I think it starts to show its age. First of all there's a large bezel around the screen and secondly I'm not the biggest fan of this MBUX version. Where it does redeem some points is the fact that you have separate buttons for your climate control. In terms of storage there's a nice tambour door here which gives you an inductive phone charging port, a couple USB-C, and you also have these beverage holders, really wide, also fairly deep, so I think it'll grip your bottles in place. You can also get options to have these heated or cooled. Not this particular car here, but that's available. Really nice wide opening as well, because the wheel base is pretty long. 
the wheel arch doesn't really impede into your ingress. The door also opens fairly wide, almost at a, I would say, 80 to 85 degree angle. So putting in child seats, for example, would be easier. Interior door materials are really fantastic. So there is no skimping out from the front to the rear. The top is also very plush. This seat is set to my driving position. I'm five foot eight or about 1.73 meters. I mean, it speaks for itself. Look at the amount of space here. I could probably keep a small suitcase in front of me if I needed to. There's plenty of space for me to slide my feet under the seat as well. Headroom is plenty. Here is the key fob for the GLC. And just as a comparison, you see how the GLE looks a little bit different? Interesting. I'm glad that there's different versions of this as compared to them looking all exactly the same. Already it does feel a bit shorter, you know? So the door is, comes below my, my head, but again, inviting, very plush, soft materials up here, soft materials down here, piano black in this case. In this case, also this particular car that we have has ventilated seats on a hot sunny day like this. Oh, it's a lifesaver. The interior, of the GLC. We'll get to this in a minute, but the seats themselves are also quite different. You do get Artico or leatherette seat options here. And I think that's a nice added touch that you get more flexibility to also pick some animal free seats and hopefully in the future also pure vegan interiors. Let me get inside. I definitely don't have to step up. In fact, I have to stoop a little bit down to get into the GLC. And this just coming from the GLE automatically feels like I'm sitting actually in a car. The roof line is not that tall. These interior rings have ambient lighting. In fact, there's ambient lighting up here, ambient lighting around here. If you like ambient lighting like me and my wife, this is definitely the better interior. Plus you can make the light brighter inside as well. The design on the dashboard is quite different. Even here you get different options for the actual inlay. I'm not the biggest fan of this kind of a gray. I would have preferred a more wood tone or something else. What do you guys think? And of course the floating MBUX screen now in a portrait orientation. And as you can see, it controls everything because there's very few buttons and that too haptic buttons where you have to slide for the volume and things like that. Yes, you can press for the mute and of course the hazard lights, but in general, especially here, as you see, the climate control is all controlled with the touchscreen. Now, the benefit is it takes not much time to get used to it. And I find in practical everyday use, I don't change this temperature all too often. So I'm not really fiddling around with this. It's going to take care of it. You also have the voice assistant and you can tell that to change the temperature as well if you don't like using the touchscreen. I understand some people like it, some people don't. I personally have gotten used to touchscreen uh, climate systems. But what I do appreciate as compared to the older MBUX on the GLE is the landing home screen. You see how there are widgets that display the kind of information I want to see. I can have my phone information, some other information here. I can choose which widgets the landing home screen also has a large map that I can quickly glance at. So the real estate is completely occupied by useful information as compared to just a background. So this is what I appreciate. And also if I go to the main menu, these tiles are so big, they're so colorful. I know exactly which color and which tile. So if I want media, I know it's a big purple square. If I want phone, it's a big green square and it's a big easy target for me to touch even while driving. So definitely much more modern. I like this because you have four different spokes. And while you have haptic buttons here as well, it's easy again for muscular memory to know, okay, this is to control the screen. This is for the adaptive cruise control. This is for media and so on. So you know, up, down, left, right. It's easy to isolate these functions with muscular memory. Paddle shifters as well. And then same story when we come to the actual screen, you have different, views that you can have for your instruments and also a really nice um, head-up display. In fact, I would even say this might be even a bit, a smidge larger than on the GLE. All right. So first of all, wheelbase, not so long. Therefore, the wheel arch does impede a little bit into your entry space. Also the fact that this door is not that wide, nor does this open 
to the same degree, I would say. It's a little bit less than the uh, GLE. But the door itself, again, has nice material. So they haven't skimped out on the top nor the bottom where you put your elbow. Again, more ambient lighting here at the rear as well to entertain your passengers. Same knurled finish on this for the window control, but hard plastic down here for the bottle holder. So getting inside, not too bad. Again, it's not as low as a standard C-Class uh, sedan or an estate, but definitely feels a lot more smaller as expected. And I think this also speaks for itself. Same, this is my driving position. I'm five foot eight. And sitting behind myself, of course, I'm not gonna complain. It's definitely spacious enough. There's plenty of knee room, plenty of place for me to slide my feet under as well. In fact, I do feel like I'm sitting a little bit higher than I was in the GLE. Not a big deal. Definitely, I don't feel like my knees were up in the GLE, but this does feel like I'm sitting a little bit higher, the waist to uh, heel kind of uh, distance. And I do love this panoramic roof. My recommendation is always get it for uh, the GLE as well. As you can imagine, the trunk is a similar story. This is about 460 liters, so definitely smaller. If I were to put the ruler from the back seat till here, it's about 94 centimeters or about 37 inches. If we were to take the height up to the roof here, that's about 74 centimeters or about 29 inches. I also like the fact that you have the switch here to lower the rear of the car with the air suspension. You have switches to tumble the seats as well. You get a lot more trunk volume. We can remove this all together. That is about 195 centimeters or about 77 inches. GLE, of course, is even bigger with 630 liters of boot space. And remember, you can even get this as a seven-seater option and a long wheelbase is sold in some markets as well. But already, there is no kind of guide track for the parcel shelf. And in this, in this particular version, there aren't any switches to tumble the rear seats. So, come on, I think that should just be given a standard. But regardless, the space is definitely so much more practical. This is about 41 inches or 104 centimeters. Similarly, down here, you have a huge extra storage area as well. To tumble the seats in this case, I have to go around. Now, if you were to take a quick look at the distance to the front seats, yeah, wow, about 197 centimeters or about 77 inches. But I think more significant than these dimensions is also the height, which is definitely more, more squared off. You know, it's not so curved. It's a lot more usable across the entire width, about 80, 83, 82, 83 centimeters and that's about 32 and a half inches. Both these SUVs can be had with a wide range of petrol, diesel, and hybrid powertrain options. To keep things comparable, we have the 450D version of both. This is a three liter inline six turbo diesel engine making 367 horsepower, PS metric horsepower, and they both have mild hybrid boost. In fact, the GLC, since it's a little bit lighter at two tons as compared to 2.4 tons, is faster to 100 kilometers per hour than its AMG 43 counterpart at 4.7 seconds. So, properly quick. They come mated to the 9G Tronic automatic transmission and, of course, the 4Matic all-wheel drive system. They also both get air suspension. Yet, thanks to the new platform, the GLC is the one that gets rear axle steering. This, not even an option. Let's kick things off by taking the GLE for a spin. Now, this has air suspension it's really smooth, very soft, very composed. The noise insulation is also really nice. If anything, I hear a little bit of the tires. They are summer tires. They're on 21 inches uh, and they're quite wide. So there's a little bit of tire noise, but wind noise is absolutely null. It's not a windy day. It's, it's the middle of the afternoon on a summer day. So the air is very still, but definitely noise insulation is really nice. This expansive interior space also lends to this calm demeanor of this SUV with the ADAS doing the heavy lifting for me. I am re really cocooned in a nice, you know, 
relaxing ambiance. Aiding that, also I have some fun little features here like the kin uh, seat kinetics, for example. You can also get massaging seats depending on the options you select, but uh, that also kind of moves the seat a little bit. Now we're coming up to this traffic jam. See, it's I'm not doing anything. It's hitting the brakes a bit too sharply. And you know, it's like I would have pressed the brakes a lot sooner, but because this ADAS, again, doesn't really think too far ahead, it waits a little bit towards the end to hit the brakes, even though I have the distance set to, I think, almost the maximum, just because, you know, we're filming, so we want to be extra safe. So it doesn't react as sharply as some of the other systems out there. Visibility is also fantastic. Really wide front windshields, large, tall windows on either side, and really chunky, big outside rear view mirrors. So you can really get a nice view of your surroundings. Of course, when you're navigating through tight spaces in the city, you have the 360 camera that you can quickly turn on if you need. And to be honest, even though this is a pretty big SUV and it doesn't have rear axle steering, maneuverability is not compromised. I think it's surprisingly nimble and you can squeeze into gaps. I think the front wheels steer at a pretty, pretty sharp angle and this really aids in being able to maneuver it in tight spaces. But yeah, this ADAS system now and this stop and go traffic on the Autobahn is basically driving itself. It's coming to a stop, it's setting off. In the city though, I've noticed that you need to tap on the accelerator pedal after you've come to a full stop at a traffic light to then tell it to start driving again. It won't pull away when the light changes and the car in front drives away. But that's fine, I think you can live with that. Let's talk about mileage. So this is a diesel, so it's on the slightly more fuel efficient side compared to just a pure petrol engine, but it is 2.4 tons. It is all wheel drive and it is a three liter inline six diesel. So we're getting about 9.7 liters for 100 kilometers. That's, that's pretty steep. High speed mannerisms, I can tell you from this platform, it's really great. Nothing really phases the GLE. It's so big, the air suspension squats down at high speed, so it really feels like it's gripping the, gr the road really well. There's too much traffic now for me to really floor it, but if you want, you can watch the GLE, the AMG 53 hybrid that I tested just a couple months ago, uh, and again, similar platform, so it really feels stable out on the highway. In the city, the GLE is surprisingly friendly. Now, this tall seating position means that I'm able to place the car in these narrow lanes. And again, because of the sharp steering angle that is uh, possible with the front wheels, it does a good job of helping you squeeze in these little gaps like this. I live in a very narrow little part of, you know, of Europe and just <laughs> parking the car in my neighborhood is a, uh, it's, it's quite tight, but I didn't feel like this was going to be out of place. It didn't feel like a monster truck. So it's surprisingly useful. It will certainly benefit significantly from rear axle steering. So I hope with the new platform, whenever they release that, uh, they're able to incorporate that. I think this needs it. And other competitors in this segment, even the, the Touareg platform, all of those SUVs get rear axle steering. So I think the GLE definitely needs it. Let's go into sport mode and let's put our foot down. Not bad. I mean, all things considered, not bad at all. I like the sound of the engine, I must say. I like this diesel. It's smooth, it's refined, it's a straight six. So again, a very, uh, a, 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 you know, a very balanced configuration for an engine. If I were to take this corner now, body roll is also well contained, I would say. Let's see, there's a, there's not much traffic around here. I'm going to slow down. Let's bring it all the way down to standstill. All right. And then we're going to put our foot down. Oh, it's actually shifting at around four and a half thousand RPM. Not bad for a diesel engine. That's surprisingly revving high. So there is power that it's being generating throughout. In fact, you also really don't notice 
that the hybrid, mild hybrid system is, is working away in the background. It's, it's filling in all the little gaps of turbo lag. This 9G Tronic is really sharp with the changes, so smooth, but really quick as well. You can of course take manual control, you can click on the manual button here and use the paddle shifters if you like. But I think the character of this SUV, you want it to do its own thing. So it's definitely something that you can enjoy driving. All things considered, it is as sporty as this kind of a fact form factor would allow it to be. Let's see how it behaves on some really rough roads, some potholed roads. Ooh, there we go. See, it thought there was a car in front of me. There is no car in front of me. <laughs> Hitting these speed bumps. Oh my God, I didn't even feel it. I didn't even feel that I went over a speed bump. You didn't even see that, did you? know? it's so smooth. So definitely very smooth. This is a very narrow road. And even if I were to drop the outside wheels, there's no sharpness that's filtering in. So definitely really nicely sprung suspension here. Now we're in the GLC. In fact, I've parked the GLE right behind me in this quite narrow a parallel parking street lot. So let's start by actually testing this rear axle steering to help us get out of this tight spot. So again, lovely 360 view camera. So you can see the GLE behind us. There's a green pole. I also like this kind of, uh, this, this parking sensor line. And there you go. Just with that ease, Super easy, super convenient. The steering is so light now. Just watch this. I can, I can almost do, almost, I could almost have done a complete U-turn in just this little lane. So rear axle steering really makes a big difference. If anything, as you can imagine, the GLE needs it more, but the GLC definitely is better off with it. And it really, helps shorten the wheelbase at low speeds, like right now. I can also feel it's, it's a fun sensation that the rear also steps out. It's like it's dancing. So the rear wheels turn in the opposite direction, ever so slightly by a few degrees at low speeds to then effectively shorten the radius of the turning diameter or the, yeah, the turning radius. And at high speeds, it turns in the same direction as the front wheels, again, only by a few degrees to elongate the turning radius and this way you're kind of you're, the nose isn't pitching and, and and turning left and right so much it's almost like a quasi strafing kind of action this makes it more stable at high speed so best of both worlds it's completely a steer by wire system so um, it decides into how much to steer based on these different factors like speed so definitely much easier to drive in the city and jumping from the GLE to this GLC, it really does feel like I'm sitting in a car. The roof line is fairly low. The seating position is also, it's a little bit more upright than a regular C-Class, but it is, it's, it's not a full SUV feeling, I would say. I've turned on the ADAS system because let's start off by driving on this, on this, uh, on the street to just test that out. So the speed limit has changed from 50 to 70 now. The system recognizes that. And this is a little bit more sophisticated when it comes to these kinds of things. It reads this, uh, I feel like it reads the traffic signs that are further up ahead and already preemptively plans for them. So if there's a speed limit that's changing, it, it starts slowing you down much sooner than the GLE does. We're coming up to a red light. It's already slowing me down as compared to hitting the brakes at the last minute that the GLE did. So I can already feel the benefits of this new generation. This is also much lighter than the GLE. And therefore, for 244 kilometers that I've been testing this car, it's giving me 7.8 liters for 100 kilometers. So much more acceptable, definitely, with the same 3 liter inline 6 cylinder turbo diesel. Visibility is actually not bad at all. So it's definitely uh, not bad. It's just in comparison, the windshield is a little bit shorter, it feels. The windows are also a little bit shorter. The roof line is a little bit closer to me. 
So it doesn't feel as spacious and as large on the inside. And that also maybe makes it feel a little bit not as grand and grandiose as the GLE because I feel like I'm in something a bit more compact. The steering also has a really nice grip and these twin spoke design on either side really helps with the muscle, with the muscle memory, like I said, for turning on and off these cruise control systems. Noise insulation at these speeds at 70 kilometers per hour. It's very quiet. Narrower tires um, also mean that I don't hear much of the tire noise. Again, on a still day like this, there is no wind noise to speak of. So you do really feel like you're cocooned in luxury. These seats are also very comfortable. Seat kinetics, you know, like after a long drive, you feel like doing this to kind of stretch out your back. Well, that's kind of what the seat kinetics do on its own. Like, that's what I feel like. So it kind of moves the backrest a little bit back and forth. It's just so that you, you change position to release some of the stress um, on certain points that you've been, if you've been sitting for hours, it kind of helps move those weight and pressure points across different parts of your back to make it more comfortable on longer journeys. This also has something fun called the energizing comfort. So it plays a little program, you know, you have refresh, warmth, vitality, joy, and it, it for example, turns on the seat ventilator, it, it blows colder air, it plays a nice animation and some sound, the ambient lighting changes, the seat also can move a little bit. So it uses all of these little functions to try to rejuvenate you on a long drive. Of course, massage seats, I think the GLC platform is, I mean, it's really a dynamic platform. It's really stiff. This feels so much more like a car to drive than the GLE does. It's much more communicative. There is less of this kind of wallowing. Because of that lightness, it's more sprightly. It's light on its feet, you can feel that. The rear axle steering also makes it really energetic and lively and, and agile. This is definitely a very dynamic platform, period, full stop. Not in any comparison, it's just, in general, a really nice and dynamic platform. That being said, like for example right now, look at this. It automatically will turn on the indicator. It's changing the lane for me and it's continuing. I, was, I wasn't paying attention because it knows the speed limit is 100. It sees that there's space on the left lane. The guy in front of me was going slow. I shouldn't take my hands off the wheel. So it deactivated it, but the minute I put it back on, it turned on the indicator and changed lanes for me and it's speeding up. So again, on long journeys, if you have a family, oh, it's, it wants to come back to the right lane. Okay, cool, thank you. Come on, that's pretty cool, right? That's pretty cool. On long drives, in the dark, when you've been, because I love going on long drives, and when I do like a two week road trip, the last two days are always the toughest. You know what I mean, right? You've been driving for thousands of kilometers at that point, and you need a vacation from your vacation, but then, oh, I have to drive all the way back from Barcelona, or I have to drive all the way back from Positano. Those are two long days of driving. A system like this, that would go by in a flash. It would feel so much more confident. It would be so much safer. So yeah, definitely. Let's go now to sport mode. There we go. Remember, 4.7 seconds, zero to 100 kilometers per hour or 62 miles per hour. Woohoo! Look at that. Just gonna go around this roundabout a couple more times. Really nice throttle response. The sound also is I think there's a sound actuator that's bringing some more of the sound inside, but this feels really like a small little sports car. Because of that rear axle steering, it does feel light. The engine does sound nice with the sport mode. There is a sound actuator, definitely. And it really does, again, coming back to the fact that it feels more like a car, this air suspension gives you so much versatility. In this mode, it lowers down, it's more taut, gives you more connection, steering gets heavier. Oh, definitely a lot more punchy acceleration than the GLE. So that 400 kilos 
seems like it makes a big difference. And being sleeker and shorter also lends it more aerodynamic benefit, I would say. The 90 Tronic shifts really nicely. Even in the sport mode, when it knows that I'm not calling upon all that power, it shifts up rather quickly. Now it's in fifth gear, just taking at 1,300 RPM, 1,400 RPM. So it's also not constantly holding high revs. I would say the GLE just out of brute force flattens this a lot more. I can feel this bouncing me around a little bit more. So objectively, same road within an hour of each other. Yeah, this is not bad, but definitely more jiggly than the GLE. <laughs> more jiggly than the GLE. There you go. Back to sport mode. But acceleration is definitely, definitely much more sharp. Let's see if there's a safer place to do from a z zero. Let's see if we can pass this area here and do a quick acceleration test. Let's look around for safety. No pedestrians, no cyclists, no cars. All right, here we go. From standstill in sport mode. Just gonna put my foot down. The acceleration starts a lot sooner. It's a lot more pronounced. Definitely a healthier amount of torque. Sound is nicer as well with this sound actor. And the dynamic capability definitely much better here in the GLC. So I think there's some conclusive evidence that you can use now for making your decision. This particular GLC is about 85,000 euros and this GLE is about 105,000 euros. But the tricky bit is you can vary the options significantly, which is the right one for you. Let's break it down. First, the design. I personally like the more traditional SUV design of the GLE as compared to the more crossover design of the GLC. The interior as well is a bit more traditional with more buttons, more space on the interior, and also comes as a seven seat option. But I think in terms of technology, it is abundantly clear that the GLC has the better ADAS as well as the better MBUX. And therefore, my decision is the GLC. But let me know what you think. Put it down in the comments below and compare the GLC with some of these other options as well.